we can be resourceful ourselves right we can uza kujitegemea like we can make this thing self sustaining we can't keep expecting like some donor in america to send us money 40k every month so our kids can learn you know this worry is really hard to get from these donors because they don't understand they really don't understand what we are doing and so they're like you know but if you get a, a parent if you get a parent to contribute to the program they're going to be like hey i paid you 100 shilling why is my kid not building a website yet so that kind of ownership and then also our like our marketing everything becomes to the parent we market to the parent we market to the local community and that's where you see the decency coming in because yes. if we were trying to get our kids to talk to american donors we were going to be forcing them to speak english but here we are like hey just record this in kalenjin you're sending this to your mom so your mom can see what you're learning in school Salam and hello everyone. My name is Lily Bakala Piper and as always I am so happy that you tuned in today and you are going to be so happy that you tuned in today as well. As you know throughout the month of March we have been thrilled to bring you a different African woman every single week from a different country talking about the way that she is putting her mark on the country. Well today to culminate our series for Women's History Month and this amazing women that we've been talking to we have one of Kenya's own daughters CNN Hero of the Year for 2022 and a Forbes under 30 under 30 Nelly Chaboy Nelly is the founder of Techlit Africa she is a tech entrepreneur She is a lover of technology, data software, programming, children, young people, and she believes that poverty has an expiration date. This bold, audacious woman just was crowned CNN Hero of the Year in a beautiful ceremony just at the end of 2022. Many people of course paid attention and saw that ceremony and if they didn't see it at the time, they definitely saw the show afterwards because one of the most beautiful parts of the ceremony was when she brought her mom up to the stage and honored her in front of the entire world and in the presence of all the other CNN heroes whose work was truly exceptional. But Nelly's work rose to the top and when you hear her story, you'll understand why. As a former teacher myself and a daughter of this place, I feel deep and immense pride in Nelly's story. Nelly believes in the power and the potential of rural Africa, and if you didn't know, 72% of Kenya's population lives in rural parts of the country. And in the continent of Africa, over half of our population lives in rural areas. And yet much of our work and our conversation is leaving that critical part of our community behind. but the work of Techlit Africa is demanding that we pay attention and bring along our brothers and sisters from every corner of our country and our continent. So I think you're going to be completely delighted by this conversation with this entrepreneur, this thinker, this innovator, and not just CNN's hero of the year but ours too. And so it is my great pleasure and honor and delight to welcome Nelly Chaboy to Salam and Hello. Nelly Karibu sana. So happy to have you here. <laughs> oh my god, what an intro. <laughs> Listen, we get oh one god. chance <laughs> to say thank you. So this is my chance to say thank you and welcome. Oh, that is awesome. So warming, so hard warming. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So let's just dive right in. You are a busy woman who has just come back to Kenya after talking to really the world about the work that you have been doing across, you know, your community. So For those who haven't yet heard the story of Techlit Africa, give us a glimpse into the work that you are doing and and why why is it so important? So, yes, I'm Nelly Chaboy, founder and CEO of Techlit Africa, and at Techlit Africa we teach digital skills in rural primary schools. So, what we envision is that we want when our kids graduate high school that they could work remotely for any company in the world. I'm talking about Bowen being a software engineer for Google from Mogotil because we believe that you don't have to leave home to make it and um the reason that like Techlit work Techlit Africa is my life's work is because I grew up in poverty myself and 
I have always sought to find sustainable solutions towards poverty. And when I looked around, I, I just, I, a, a question that I kept asking myself over and over again, growing up in Mogotu, seeing all, how, all the different ways poverty is dehumanizing is that, what is it about us? What is it about Africans? What, are, we, are we just born to suffer? What is going on? And the more that I read books and I traveled, I realized that we have a lot of systemic issues. For example, if you want to get a business loan in Kenya, you're looking at that 10% interest rate. So what is happening in Kenya is that everyone is a small business owner, just one person running the business, not able to grow to become a medicine business that can actually employ people and create employment. If you look at our education system, primary schools and high schools are so expensive and it's crazy, right? Yeah. But then if you're to make high school, if you're to make primary schools free or high schools free, where's the money coming from? We don't have people are not don't have formal employment to collect taxes to pay for that. And so when I was just looking at all these systemic issues, I just felt overwhelmed. Like how do we fix it? Until I stumbled upon technology and I realized actually if we can build a digital infrastructure. It's one of the easiest things to build because all you need to do is give someone a computer and give them the skills. And then all of a sudden, they're tapping into a global market. They're tapping into the global economy. You don't need to have perfect taxation or small low, uh, like uh, low interest loans or free schools for someone to tap into it. You just need to teach them and show them how to hustle online. And just yeah. by design, as Africans, we have grit, we have hustle because we are suffering. And so can you imagine instead of hustling in Mogotio, you have the entire world at your fingertips, at your phone. And that's that's really the the vision and the mission behind Techland. You know, it's 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 incredible. You are young. I am very humbled when I think about how much you have done in your young life. And yet your story is not a fast one and it's not an easy one. So we're, we're hearing your story by no means at the finish line, but at an important juncture where your work has started to get a lot of recognition. But take us back to some of your beginnings and take us on the path that led you to creating TechLit Africa. You've told us what you do. How did you arrive at that stumbling point when you stumbled upon technology? <laughs> oh, well, it goes way back. I um, I grew up in here in Mogotio. I grew up in a teen group house, so in Yubaya Mabati. And the two, two specific uh, things about that house. One, uh, the roof was like, uh, it was all rusted, so it was full mm. of holes which means that when it rains, like, you know, it's just like the roof is leaking. And I slept on the floor my entire, I think I slept on the floor my entire childhood. And I remember I used to sleep. So the, also the room was full of holes. So it used to be a, like a cement floor, but it was all disintegrated. So there were only patches of cement. And um, we did not, we were not having guests. We were not bringing people over in that house. And But there was this specific spot near the door that I used to lay down like, and then I'll, I'll, because it's only like a small patch of cement, I'll have to hold my torso close by and I will look at the roof. So during a sunny day, like mid afternoon, the lights will just be bouncing around. And it was almost like such a, like, this is a very sad house, right? Like we're not even having guests, but like looking at the lines, like the lights bouncing around, it was so spectacular. It was almost like the ray of hope. And so mm. I used to get, that are light and I'll just think about sustainably fixing poverty and and I think I really I really started thinking about poverty and thinking about ways I can fix it just from looking around me like my mom yeah. my mom like it was mostly my mom and I because my elder sisters were in boarding school like they were in high school and the, the other one was too young so most of my formative years I spent with my mom either at the Kibanda to pick a chapati and mandazis or either like selling vegetables or selling mangoes at the market or herding cows. Often I was on weekends, I was like, and so, but what she kept doing, she kept telling me stories about people in the community. Like she told me about um, Bishop Koske, who was on a wheelchair. And at that time, like during my childhood, like that, that guy was very respected. Like, hey, he's a bishop, like he's kind of doing mm. well. He's the father to uh, Emi, Emi Koske. You know Emi Koske? Like, I don't right? know her, but tell me. Emi, <laughs> Emi Koske. 
Okay, is like you know a, a you know very famous gospel artist, and so by the time like she wasn't that famous yet. But even though like and then she was telling me about how hard his life was growing up in a wheelchair, and so I I she just kept telling me these stories. And I will just cry. I'll just cry. But when I hear these stories of people who are coming from really, really sad life, even sadder than ours, and they're being able to kind of like, they're a little bit making it, it kind of first taught me empathy and it kind of gave me some kind of hope. Hmm. And so I, so she just like, she would tell me these stories. She would, she was so real. And so growing up, in that setup, even though like it was very sad, you know, we're still struggling with food. Um, there was just a lot of inspiration. And so I spent most of my time in my head, you know, that that patch of cement, looking at the roof bouncing around of or herding cows and sitting under an acacia tree, reading books. And so I was mostly alone because I was I didn't really have a child. Like if I'm not in school, I'm doing something. Either You're working. Yeah. Or yes, yes. Mm. So I was mostly in my head and all I kept thinking about was fixing poverty. And so, so, so Nelly, I want to just pause you there because most children, I, I'm a mother myself, I have four kids, I know you're one of four yourself, so mm-hmm. I know how busy that life is both as a mother and also my kids are young enough that I'm thinking, a lot of kids are not thinking about how to fix things, even if they're not in poverty, they're not necessarily thinking of solutions for their life. Is it your mom's relationship with you and that closeness? Is it what what generates this kind of problem solving mentality in you? I don't know. I I wish I could point at Just it. Just you? I, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I really think I I have no idea. I I have no. Idea. But what I did know, what I really did know, is that I think the biggest disconnect for me was you go to school and they tell you like, oh work hard and things will work out for you. And I'm looking at my mom and she's working really hard and we are still in poverty. And so yes. I just, I was just so curious. I'm like, hey, why is our lives like this? Do every kid have to worry about this? And I think co- combined with my mom telling this inspiring, telling me this inspiring stories from people in my our communities, seeing how hard she's working to raise us and educate us. And then also being alone most of my childhood because I'm doing all these chores or herding cows. A combination of that, I think, just having that time to myself where I kind of have to entertain myself. Like um, I, I, I would rather yeah. like I would like to go and play blada with my friends, but not chunga ngombe, so I kind of have to. And so I think just the combination of that and and knowing that, I think what I really wanted <laughs> actually, I just really wanted to go and play with my friends, and I couldn't do that. So what I kept thinking is like, oh. How can I make sure that kids from Mogotio have the time? Like the thing where you say, like, leave a place better than you found it. So yeah. I kept thinking, okay, if I, don't, if I don't have a childhood myself, how can I ensure that kids coming after me can have a childhood? And so it's like, oh, maybe if they had food and they did not have to work really hard to acquire food, then maybe they can go play. Or maybe if they had a nice house, then they can have, I don't know, like they can study at home. And I I just kept thinking, I think I was thinking about ways of fixing my own problems, but I couldn't fix my own problems. So I was thinking about how I could fix it for others. So, you know, all of that drive and that mental stimulation of your own imagination really sounds like really motivated you through primary, through secondary. You performed exceptionally well in secondary. You won a scholarship Mm -hmm. to a, a school in the U.S., to Illinois, <laughs> of all places. Mm-hmm. I used to live in mm-hmm. Illinois. So when I read that part of your story, I was like, ah, I can imagine landing in Illinois from Kenya and what a difference it is, even though they do share some similarities for sure. Tell me, you know, a lot of the stories in the press have been about kind of um, what you gave up to come back to Kenya and start TechLit Africa. But I'd love to hear from you. What do you feel like you gave up to go to the U.S.? to get your education because so much of the story is like, you know, America is this beacon of whatever, whatever. But as I listen to you, I think you gave so much both to your classmates and your communities in the U S as much as you brought back. So I, I want to hear from you. What, what did it cost you Nelly to actually leave your home, to leave Mogotio, to leave your mom who had walked with you and, and instilled this imagine, imagination in you to go and pursue your studies in the U S 
That's a very interesting question. I think I think I don't really like that part of my story that I had to leave home to make it. And that's mm. why, as I mentioned at the beginning, for Declare Africa is that we're trying to figure out like you don't have to leave home to make it, right? You can access you don't have to. These yeah. resources from where you are. And like like normally like the immigrant story is like, oh, you go out there in a far away land, you work really hard. And then exactly. you sign, send money home for people that you never see. And so, and, and I think, uh, uh, I, I think when I think about my story, when I think about like going to America to do that, to be able to do that in Africa, it makes me really sad. And I think it makes me really sad, particularly because that is not how you fix a nation. <laughs> you, exactly. we, can't, we can't keep sending people away. We can't try to like, but instead, we should all stay here and find ways to fix it. And and I don't think I ever really left home. I kept coming home all the time. I remember, I remember, like, I went to America in 2012, like, like August 2012. And then, like, June 2013, I'm talking about coming home. And they're like, wait, what? How much is I had to get? I'm saying, what, $800? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, my yeah. family was so surprised. Yeah. Why, why do you keep coming why do you keep coming home? And so I just kept coming home. And every time I came home, it almost like opened my mind. Like the first time I came home was to come and move my family out of our, our house, move into an apartment with electricity. We even had DSTV. People were coming to, like we were hosting people for the first time. The next time I came home, I realized that I could actually build a school. And so it was always, every time I came home, like, just my world open up and it just became really clear things that I, I should be able to do. Yeah. You know, well, the, the, Nelly, the beautiful thing is I think because of the work that Tech like Africa is doing, many kids won't have to leave home in order to make it. That's exactly what, you know, yeah. your whole mission is now going to bridge that. They won't even have so to many. go to Nairobi. Which you didn't even want to do, which is also, I was saying before we talked, when are you coming to Nairobi? And you're like, why would I come to Nairobi? So <laughs> that's so powerful, just that there's going to be a bridge now to opportunity, because it's a thousand percent true that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is what we're missing. Opportunity is what has not reached every corner as it should. And that's absolutely what Tech Africa is doing. So, you know, talking about poverty is not easy. It's delicate. Um, as I hear your story, it reminds me so much of my parents' story. So I'm, I'm I'm very much older than you. And then my parents, of course, then another generation. But so much of your story reminds me of theirs, of growing up without, without a bed, without access to resources and hoping for something better. Um, how have you managed to tell this story to Western audiences and still convey this deep love that you have for Mogotia, because as I've watched and listened to interviews, there is deep joy in your voice and there's deep love. And I think sometimes what international press and Western media is, is trying to mine and add these stories is, is different than the story that you're telling. So tell me how you're able to talk about poverty um, in these international spaces who, who may never come to Kenya and, and know the beauty that you know. So uh, when I, there's this very specific thing that happened to me. So I was, I was, yes, I was teaching at a nine-year-old in Chicago how to code. So a friend of mine, um, and, and so uh, he had an idea. So they, they were doing a program where they need to build an app to solve a specific problem. And this nine-year-old was like, oh, I want to build an app. And the app is like, I want to be able to fundraise to send money to Africa. Hmm. And I was like, okay. So he shows me this app, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a landing page, right, of a kids, really like very, very ugly picture of the continent. And and I said, right, and then he was telling me things like, oh, people in Africa, you know, like there's so much sadness, they don't have food, so I want to really help these people. And I looked at this nine-year-old boy, and I just had immense sadness. I was like. This is what we've been reduced to. Like, mm. like Mama Africa has just been reduced to sadness, but we are like vibrant. We are complicated. We are just, you know, we are so complicated. And so, and and so I think uh, the next time I went to Kenya, like uh, this time I was just trying to figure out Tech like, Africa, I bought a camera and I was like, if there's one thing I'm going to do <laughs> is rewrite how people look at look at Africa and and look at the continent. And so like 
if you look at our social media, if you look at everything, is always very, very vibrant, very, very upbeat. Nothing like that kind of guilt tripping where you're trying to be like so sad, be like, oh, this kid never ate, like send ten dollars to help it. No. Our kids are teaching you how to build websites in Swahili. Our kids are like, we are like, <laughs> if you want to know what they're saying, look at the captions, right? And so it's almost like, and when they talk in Swahili, they are just, you can see their personality. You want to hang out with them. Everyone knows about Bowen now because they have seen videos of Bowen. And all of Bowen videos, he was just speaking Swahili. Right? Yeah. And so, and so for, <laughs> and, and so for me, I think, uh, it, it became very important to just show. And even when I talk about my story, I yes, I do describe the sadness just to paint the picture, but I also talk about the resilience. I talk about how far we have come. I've talked, I talked about like how we have a very simple solution here, which is to support investing in these kids and giving them digital skills. So yeah. I have refused to be reduced to what so many um NGOs do which is I think my the thing I hate the most is like there's this picture you see a girl who has been given sanitary towels and they are they are holding like always a sanitary pad on one hand and then they are holding a panty and I'm like this is a 15 year old guy even you like would you be okay someone taking a picture of you holding a pad and a panty absolutely (laughs) yeah never yeah never in my life yeah (laughs) so what I normally what we normally ask ourselves is like uh if that the person in the picture like the student or the parent or whoever you're taking a picture of if they see that story or they see that picture would they be proud of themselves would they be happy and the answer is no we don't share that yeah that's beautiful you know i i talked to wawira and jiro from um food for education Mm -hmm. And she has a very similar philosophy. She's like, we do not put any children on our social media that are hungry, that are, you know, bloated bellies. She's like, never. We we, we tell the story of joy because that's the truth. That is what we experience in our communities every day. And um, more power to you, uh, Nelly, because you're absolutely right. We need to rewrite the story that people understand about our, our home. So let's dive deep into Tech That Africa and the work that you're doing. Because if I read correctly, at some point, you thought you might be investing in building the tech skills and the tech literacy of adults. And then you switched yeah. to children. <laughs> So tell me, tell me why you switched to, from from the old people <laughs> to the young. So the story. So what had happened is that um, so it was twenty eighteen. Point Tyler, my co-founder, uh, we had been dating for two years, and so he was coming to Kenya with me uh, to just uh, meet my family, and so we bring in the we bring in ten computers in our backpacks, and we had a perfect idea. We were saying that oh. The only problem is that people don't know how, like they don't have access. So we um, we built a computer, like we kind of like set up a room with the 10 computers and we installed like all these applications that people could learn from. And we were just thinking like, all they need to is like a key and then they're good. And so, and then we go back. So we're still working in, a, you know, as software engineers. And then we go back and we made a WhatsApp group. We kept thinking, oh, people are just going to be like having the computer lab all the time. <laughs> this was this was like in August, September 2018. And then we don't hear anything. We don't hear anything at all. And 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 for me it was extremely I'm like, what happened? This is a very clear solution. That was very unsettling to me. And that's the reason why I was like, okay, I need to go back to Kenya and figure out what is going on. And that's what led us led Tyler. So we both quit our jobs and then we both came to Mokoche to figure it out. So we came to Mokoche in 2019. And so we thought, okay, maybe the issue is not like them using a computer. Maybe we should teach them very specific skills. Like if someone wants to learn social media marketing, let's find ways to teach them that. They want to learn accounting or music production and stuff like that. And and so I we went to a pool, like a pool area. We okay. had a computer right there and we told them, okay, you're going to learn how to make money with a computer? Come to the program. So they signed their name. 12 people signed up. And so we uh, we had the computer lab all cleaned, the laptops ready, 12 people came the first day. And then we just showed them like how to build WordPress sites. The next day, only six people came up. And the day after that, only three came up. And we kept thinking, oh, okay, maybe, maybe the issue is that we are teaching them only programming. Let's ask them what they want to learn. And so we teach them website. Like we wanna teach them, like they wanna be a marketer. 
marketer. We show them a video of who is a marketer and we teach them how to do that. And so they say like, oh, I want to be a marketer. So we spend the whole night coming up with a curriculum. And the next day they don't come back. It's a different group that comes back, right? And then now we ask them. And so, and meanwhile, we had kids who are just outside the school. They looking were just in, looking in, huh? We had like six, <laughs> like 60 kids. 60, like we are there with 12 computer labs, all clean. No one is in there. And then we just have kids outside. And so we were like, oh, these kids are annoying. So, <laughs> so we gave them like three laptops on a separate room. We were like, okay, here, instead of you running around and disturbing the adults from learning, what if you just, the three of you just like use three, three laptops, so 60 kids with three laptops. And, and then now the numbers kept, kept increasing. Now 100 kids were like trying to go to that little room and, and just look at a computer when only three of them are wow. using it. And then meanwhile, we're just trying to get adults to show up. And so we even went as far as getting someone in Chicago to give us a job, like to build a website for them. And then we paid the adults to build the website. But it was mostly like, because they don't have the skills yet, we were mm-hmm. doing most of the work. And they were just helping with data entry. And we're paying them like 800 shillings an hour. Wow. And then That's good we pay. Were thinking That's that good if pay. We don't have, I know. We were thinking like if you don't have a job, they spend the time to learn. And then if it's a job, they can do the job. But they, then they, they, they just said like they'll come and they'll ask, is there a job? And we say no. And then they'll just leave or they'll spend our bundles watching YouTube videos. And so it was a, it was incredibly sad. We were just like, okay, this is. This is, this is not working. Like the num- like the kids were there demanding the product, and the adults were just not coming, and they were not showing up, and we were not growing at all. And so then we just, we just started teaching kids instead, and then the kids were like coming, and coming, and coming. And so yeah, I I think the biggest issue was that, um, it just requires a lot of uh exposure to to digital skills. Like you need to be a digital native. You need to sit down on a computer and watch a video sure. or learn something. And that is something that these adults had not gotten in their education. And so we realized that if we can actually go back to the roots and incorporate this as part of the kids' curriculum, then in a few years, these kids will just be digital native. They'll be used to it. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's beautiful how organically that that happened, that <laughs> the kids are just yeah. there. You dem- they're, they're like, here's you, you brought the solution. And then they actually made it clear, like, actually, this is we're going yeah, to be the solution to your problem. now. Which is actually so beautiful. <laughs> they stuck it out of ours. Yeah. Because it. we were just thinking, it. oh, six months, six months, these adults make money, poverty fix. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know I think that's why you know when I read that you said poverty has an expiration date I think that's why it's so beautiful that you're working with kids because you know I always tell me I don't think kids are the future I, th- I think kids are now they are right now they're today so when we think yeah. about an expiration date if you're working with kids who are working right now to not only fix today's problems but tomorrow's as well then yes there is an expiration date because it's tangible once it's in the hands of kids who are ready to move you know we old people man we're, we're harder to yeah. crack you know but but kids are just they're ready to fly you know if, they, if they're given the opportunity they're ready ready to go so yeah. so you come back to Mogotio you start working with with kids more full time. It, is are these programs now after school? Have you been able to integrate them into the school day? What does a typical day in TechLit Africa look like? So we uh, well, it is very interesting because in the beginning we were doing like an after school program. So we were doing like uh, on weekends on school school breaks, and then um, and then we noticed that that the girls were not coming back. They were not coming back to the program. And actually, I, and then mm. I actually asked myself, wait, if Tech Tech existed when I was growing up, would I have been able to go to Tech? Yeah. And the answer was no, because I did not have any free time. Yeah. Right? If I'm not in school, I'm hiding cows, I'm helping. And so yeah, these girls absolutely. were helping with their chores, but the boys were free. And so they would just come and spend time at the uh, at the computer lab, at the, op- at the open lab. And so we realized that to ensure equal access, we needed to go into schools. And so right now our program is very simple. We um, we go into an existing school and then the school set up, sets aside one room. This room, like we bring in the computers and then we also, we hire and train uh, a teacher locally 
and that that teacher is responsible for teaching the whole school. And so this program is part and parcel of this kid's curriculum. They're learning about math, let's say at age 20, at age 55, they come to the computer lab and they're learning how to build a website or they're learning about video production. And so you can imagine Excellent. being able to do that for a course of eight years. Like when the kids are in school, that's all they learn about. They graduate knowing what one plus one is. They also, they graduate knowing what JavaScript and CSS and HTML and personal branding is. Beautiful. I mean, it's being fluent in another language, you know, languages yeah. open doors and this is a language that's <laughs> going to open doors for them. Fa fa yeah. Fabulous. Um, you know, so of course, when you think about the rural areas and you think about technology, it immediately brings you up to internet access, right? Because some of the data that I pulled just in prep for this says that urban areas in, in Africa tend to have about 44% rates of internet saturation. But if you go to the rural areas, it drops to about 17%. So Kenya is pretty lucky. We do better than some of our neighboring countries. But how are you mitigating just the, the, the simple issue of just internet and broadband access? We don't, we actually don't use the internet. Uh, ah, for a few okay. reasons. Internet is not, it's not safe for these kids. Yeah. Like you, you don't want to, we will need like a whole team of cybersecurity people to make sure that our kids are safe online. So true. Uh, the internet is also very expensive, as you mentioned. And then it's very distracting. How can you teach a kid touch typing when they could watch YouTube videos all day? And so our program is very skills based. So we have, we have three pillars, which is uh, personal branding, like just internet skills, being able to represent yourself online, being able to communicate like on a video or, or, like we normally, the way our program works is that we give kids projects, like they follow a tutorial and then they make their own projects awesome. and then we record them presenting presenting to their parents. And so uh, by that, we are able, we're able to gauge if they understood what they were doing, if it's coding, if they understood it, what concept they used from what they learned. And then being able to present to a parent, it just gives you that personal branding, you're com confident on a camera, and if you're teaching them how to make money online, you have to be on a camera or you have to know how to sure. send emails and communicate and build a brand. And so our program is very, very skills based, which is like that internet skills and then personal branding. And then, uh, of course, hard skills like coding, like, like video production. And then the most, most, most important thing is self-efficacy. The idea that you can make things happen for you, like I feel like most of the mindset that we have, especially when it comes to technology, it's like, ikwe, ikwe. Mm. Like, like we're thinking like, oh, whatever happens, happens, like God wishes. But actually, even you as a as a as someone who is like selling biazi in let's say a place like Mogotu, I can give you an example. There's this lady called Jeriwa Uji. And I, I just I saw her Facebook page. Like all she like, I'm pretty sure like from her name, she sells Uji. And she has like 30,000 <laughs> people on, on her on her page. And she has been featured on like, you know, on Citizen TV and other places. And that's what I'm actually talking about. Like she may have, and next time I'm in I want to go to Jedwa Uji and have Uji. But she, even just by selling Uji, has been able to leverage the internet, you know, and Absolutely. grow her business. Absolutely. You know, and, and yeah. So the idea that you can use the internet, you have the self-efficacy, you can make things happen right by leveraging the tools that you have as opposed to like waiting for someone to like i don't even know like how would you get a job without the internet nowadays you just here in mogot you're waiting for someone to introduce you or ask your Absolutely. MCA. Like, you know you, you need to be online you need to be building a brand you need to be communicating you need to be out there and Definitely. so that's what we really teach them well it's just it's that's just fantastic that you've been able to teach them the skills they need for the internet without relying on the internet at this point and keeping them safe. I mean, that's the innovation. And I think the thoughtfulness around that is just so exceptional because I think someone like me, I would have just stopped at that point. If I thought, can I come and volunteer and teach your students about podcasting, for example, I would have been like, oh, but how are they going to get internet? And you're like, they don't need all those skills. Teach them how to you know, right use a mic, set it up, have a conversation, <laughs> interviewing skills. Those all are things that are not internet dependent. And well done to think about ways to give them all the skills they need when their age is right to enter the world of the internet. I mean, well done. When, when you, you think about extending your curriculum, what what could be next? What what what's on your dream list of how you might want to grow and expand those those uh, lessons for them? I think uh, we we do actually we do have like our computers are networked, 
so they're still able to send an email to each other. There's, we have like a okay. our local version of social media where they can upload their work and chat with each other, That's but it's awesome. all a closed network. It's only within the school. So we are constantly just building uh, our curriculum and iterating from what we have. But ideally, we just, we want, this is the question we keep asking ourselves. If I ask a, a second year, which is a, like a sophomore in, in high school in Chicago, if I, uh, if, I t- if I tell them, go get a job at Google, they will say, okay. So they'll go to YouTube and they'll ask themselves, okay, what do I want to be? Do I want to be a software engineer, a marketer, a product? something like that and then they'll go to youtube and learn that skill with software engineering yes. and then they'll go to linkedin and network with a recruiter or they'll find that or they'll dm them on twitter and then they'll email them and they'll ask them okay hey i, I want to work at google uh, can you mentor me or do you have an internship program or how can i go about it like they'll just just by being themselves they can do that if i ask a high schooler in kenya the same question if i tell them um go get a job at google They'll be like, well, you can work at Google. Like, how do I, I don't know anyone. And so that's always the framework that we ask ourselves. The question is always, when these kids graduate high school, would they be able to answer that question? Would they be able mm-hmm. to secure that job? And if the answer is no, we keep asking ourselves, what else do they need? And so yeah. right now we're mostly working on, on communication, like being able to introduce yourself, emailing yourself, understanding that no one owes you a reply. You don't deserve a reply just because you email someone or you DM them. Like knowing that they can learn any skill, like using YouTube, and then just inspiring them with the different projects they can make, if it's audio production or video production. And so that that's really the framework that we have. But what keeps us up at night is being able to answer that question. Like, can yeah. they leverage the internet to get what they want? There's a lot of people that need your class, actually, about nobody <laughs> owes you a DM. I can give you... <laughs> nobody owes you a reply. No, no one owes you a reply. <laughs> That's such a powerful lesson because it's not just a tech skill. It's a life skill that you're imparting to them, right? Uh, that self-efficacy, the confidence, the acumen to just navigate this world that's complex. And and you're so right that, you know, it's it's also those skills that sometimes are not available to our young people who are in rural areas and outside of the ecosystems that a lot of us in the urban areas have access to. And so introducing them to those kind of concepts are is so critical. And uh, yeah, just another way that you're serving your community. So you're in Mogotio now. You've said that's yeah. where the work is. Do you think TechLed Africa is planning to scale this beyond Mogotio? What's kind of the next five to 10 years look like for you? So we actually, so Mogotio is where our headquarters is, but we work with any school in the country. Like we have a school in Kilifi County, like near it's go, it's at the border of Mombasa and Kilifi County, so okay. that far. And so right now we are reaching like we would like to work with any school in rural Kenya, like that. That's the scope. Okay. And so the way we the way we do is that we identify people from the community from that community, and then we we hire like we interview them and we hire them to run those schools, and then they just come to training on Saturdays. Okay. So we're able to, even if it's a school is in Mogotio and one in Kilifi County, they are still getting the same curriculum because they're they're getting the same training mm-hmm. and we're giving them the same tools like our, our operating, like our custom operating system and so on. Another really crucial thing that we do is that we charge the schools. We, be ch- we charge them. Yeah. So yeah, the schools cover the ongoing costs. So okay. Uh, it costs us about 40,000 Kenya shillings a month for us to run a program in a school. And if you do the math, if a school has 400 kids, that's only 100 shillings a month. And so you can imagine once the computers are here and then we go into a new school and the school is able to raise that money by mobilizing the parents. And so it means that those co- that computer lab can run forever. Because a parent, each parent is computing 100 shillings, it's creating job. And then that money is used to, you know, pay the teacher, train the teacher, cover transportation costs and maintain that. Instead of being over-reliant on philanthropic dollars, right? Absolutely. And so that's that's really that's really all there is to it. It's like if you're a school and you're interested to have TechLed Africa and you, and you know you can mobilize your parents to work with us, we can come to you even if you're in Turkana or Kilifi or Lamu, it doesn't matter. We span the all um 
the whole country. And with us, that same model, we plan to expand to Uganda and Tanzania in, a, in the next few years and other parts of the continent. Because we need to have, we need to understand that we can be resourceful ourselves, right? We can, like we can make this thing self-sustaining. We can't keep expecting like some donor in America to send us money, 40K every month so our kids can learn. You know, this money is really hard to get from these donors because they, don't understand, they really don't understand what we're doing. And so they're like, you know, but if you get a, a parent, if you get a parent to contribute to the program, they're going to be like, hey, I paid you a hundred shilling. Why is my kid not building a website yet? So that kind of ownership. And then also our like our marketing, everything becomes to the parent. We market to the parent. We market to the local community. And that's where you see the decency coming in. Because yes. if we were trying to get our kids to talk to American donors, we are going to be forcing them to speak English. But here we're like, hey, just record this in Kalenjin. We're sending this to your mom. So your mom can yeah. see what you're learning in school. So there's just so much decency and that going back to the sustainability again. And so for us, like, I don't have to spend all my time, you know, fundraising to keep the schools running. It's really, I spend more of my time talking to communities and making them understand that because these philanthropic dollars, they dry up really quickly. Yeah, I, I mean, where is the audience to stand up and cheer? Because I'm I'm going crazy, <laughs> crazy on this side I'm of the mic. Yeah. Ah, I, mean, I'm also cheer. <laughs> I mean, you know. Nelly, I'm just, I'm just, my heart is bursting with pride and joy. I just really, you know, I came back to this continent 16 years ago to do my part. And I just, I'm just, just blown away by you and your young years, very straightforward, honest, authentic, connected to home, connected to your people, you know, taking the skills you had in your hand and putting it to work in service of your of your community. It's it's the most powerful thing we can do. I think there's a saying, you know, um, our talent is God's gift to us. And then what we do with that talent is our gift to God. And really, I mean, your gifts have become a gift back to God, back to Kenya, back to our communities. And I'm just, I'm really bursting on the other side of this mic just to hear you tell the stories of Techland Africa and the work that you're doing. So I know you have to go in six minutes so I'm going to make these six minutes count <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you three more questions so you know you, you you honored your mom on this global stage I think you brought us all to tears with the song you sang with her and, and just the way you gave her a chance to be a symbol of all that is strong and beautiful uh, and courageous about the, the African mothers we have in our communities what what has her reaction been to this award and the last few months where your work has been so lauded and so rightfully lauded across the world. I, I want to give you a backstory about that song. Um, when I, as I mentioned earlier, is that my mom was just really working really hard. And she, she, I check class six, she only made it to sixth grade. And so I used to see how exhausted she is. And I, I used to sing to her that song. And then she, he used to be like, oh, you're so cute. Like, you're just a kid. <laughs> and so, and and for me, I, I think that that song, that song in itself was a promise, right? And I think and anything that I learned about, like when I go to school, I was taught that school, maybe like that song, maybe in third grade. And I kept singing to her. When I go to school and I learn a poem, like there's a poem I learned about, like God gave me a gift, which is more than a lift, a loving mother. I memorized that poem and I went to recite to her. So anything that I learned about my mom and stuff like that, I just went and, and I and and I think that is actually where most of my inspiration comes from. In that by singing her, to her that song, by realizing just how much like for 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 a temporary when I sing to her that song, I saw how like she's gonna like light up, like she like all the stress that she had kind of like for a split second with her. Hmm. and and singing that song became a tradition she comes home very late at night sometimes even at midnight because she's traveling like and i sing her that song and then she lights up she go she goes to sleep sometimes with food sometimes without food and and i think just memorizing that song it always became like i'm going to show her the world the world hmm. is going to meet her and i kept doing i kept like that that 
that promise was so internal to me that even in that moment when my name was mentioned and all cameras were on me and I was on live TV, it was a split second. Like I did not even plan that moment. I don't yeah. think I was going to win. Yeah. But to be able to bring her to say just shows you how much I had internalized that promise, right? Mm. And mm. and the reason, like another reason, when I think about that moment and I think about the whole event, is that my mom was a symbol for Mama Bogus. Like yes. these women that they become teenage mothers and nobody knows their name. They're just mm-hmm. Mama Boga. And they they die in poverty. And they and for me, I was telling my mom and all these Mama Bogas that I see you. People will not know your name. You just be Mama Boga. You may like you may be working all your life providing for your family and your community, and nobody knows your name. But I see you. Right. Yeah. And that was all that that was the backstory. And so my mom has just ever since then, she's like in town bragging talking about new york and hey. she just she loves glamour she she's just like bragging but every time like when i was in america and i will i will i'll ask her like how are you feeling she'll just bust into song a song that she used to keep singing all the time there was this song that if she was baking chapatis she would sing keep tired namane you keep tired which is like dear lord grab like hold my hand dear lord let's let's go let's walk mm-hmm. together dear lord wipe my tears away and mm-hmm. so when i was in america like she kept singing that song all the time because what, what she kept telling herself is like dear lord don't let me die in poverty and so that that event that whole thing is like my childhood dream the culmination of all that just came through that day and that is the most miraculous thing ever I say miraculous because I have a thing of willing anything into existence but I could not have made that one happen like that one was just way beyond my powers you know and so for it to happen like that on such a global stage is something I'll continue to cherish Oh, Nelly, I'm I'm speechless. That's um, you've done justice. You've done her justice. Um, God bless you. That's just really powerful. I was going to ask you to just tell us the words of the song. I, I've read it, but just for those who may not have seen it, um, that you sang on that stage that day. But I think what you've just shared with us is just such a beautiful way to to honor and to kind of wrap up our conversation. Um, oh, let me pull myself together. Uh, but before I let you go, I always ask all my guests this. So it's my last two questions and then I let you go. Nelly, what is your favorite drink? Mango juice. Easy. Mango oh. juice. I love it. <laughs> okay. Mango juice. And then I hope this will be an easy question for you too. I, this show is all about justice and joy. That's the stories that I focus on from Africa and the diaspora. So I would love to know what is bringing you joy today. Oh, all the kids! Oh my God, they're so cute. They, <laughs> they are. The biggest thing about these kids is that they will go from like learning like how to build a website to video production to audio production, and I'm like, how do you have so much energy? I can <laughs> you cannot teach me all those things and then like how because like all these skills are new to them like they're very technical skill but they are grasp they are learning it so quickly and they're learning it the right way and for me when I think about how hard it was for me to break into tech I first used a computer when I was applying to schools in the U.S. like I don't remember using a computer before that and then and how I struggled in my first job because I could not type. And then I see them like in class two or class three, just typing just fine. I think I think that's most of the reason why I do this work. It's like they make everything else sucks, but them, they just they're just so <laughs> cute. <laughs> they're worth it. <laughs> Well, may that joy be doubled and doubled and doubled back to you, Nelly. May you have the strength and the grace to continue and expand your work everywhere that it's needed. And I will be reaching out to you for Tech Lit Ethiopia. So now that you have, we have, now that we are friends, that will be our <laughs> next conversation. <laughs> Thank you Let's so much for being on Salam and Hello. I am just so delighted and grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
So listeners, we will link to all of Nelly's work in the show notes, all the places you can follow and support and learn about the incredible work that Tet. Tech Lit Africa's doing. And as always, reach out, tell us what you thought at Salam and Hello on all the socials and Lily at salamandhello.com. Wasn't it a wonderful month? March was beautiful, but don't forget to join us in April. And until we meet again, be well. Every time you smile, summer in your eyes, I, 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 don't ask me why I'm by your side. You keep me alive. Keep me